The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. You are welcome to the distance learning platform of the Ministry of Secondary Education. Today, we are going to dive again into philosophy and I'm the teacher for the day. And my name is Basilis Chintum. I will be taking you both in African philosophy. And uh, before we start the lesson today, which is uh, our seventh lesson for lower six, we'll begin by correcting the assignment I gave to you people in our previous lesson. And in your previous lesson, I asked you to identify one Cameroonian philosopher of the professional train and clearly state his view and the title of his book. And uh, you have to compare what I have here with what you have at home to see whether your answer is really closer to what is supposed to be there. And then, the Cameroonian philosopher we have identified here is uh, Marcel Towa in his book, Essay on the Philosophic Problematic of Actual Africa. And that is a, the translation from his, the French um, version, which is Essay sur la Problematique Philosophique dans l'Afrique Actuelle. And in this book, Towa is a critic of ethno-philosophy. Ethno-philosophy to him is a blind accumulation of cultural forms and is dogmatic and outdated why authentic African philosophy is supposed to be critical and actual. Since culture is collective and ethno philosophy is based on culture, Towa thinks that such philosophy which is collective is dogmatic and not critical. And then he says that ethno philosophy also betrays philosophy and ethnology. <laughs> Now we go to the seventh lesson for the day, dear students, and today we are going to work on the last trend of African philosophy, which is the nationalistic ideological trend. And then, before we proceed, these are the various articulations of the plan that we are going to follow. In the first place, we will look at the objectives, followed by previous knowledge. Previous knowledge will culminate to the problem situation. We will now get into the lesson activity proper, and then we'll end the lesson by looking at some application exercises and then I'll give you take-home assignments that you do at home, home for the next lesson. And now, what about the objectives for, the, for this lesson? The first objective is that at the end of this reflection today, this class today, you should be able to establish the relationship that exists between philosophy and development in Africa. Can African philosophy help to develop Africa? The second objective is that you should be able to evaluate the pertinence of the ideologies of African development, the various theories that African philosophers have proposed. How pertinent are those theories? Can they help Africa to emerge? And in the third place, you should be able to identify the pragmatic orientation of African philosophy. How practical is African philosophy? And in the fourth place, you should, you should be able to state the tenets of the deconstructionist approach to African philosophy. And dear students, before we proceed, let us examine um, the previous knowledge that will help you to understand this lesson. And then, before this lesson today, I know that you can identify the basic trends of ethno philosophy. We have seen that already, already in our previous classes. You can also situate the critical approach of the professional trend, that is a critic of ethno philosophy, and you can also restate the reconciliatory approach of philosophic sagacity, which try to reconcile ethno philosophy and the professional trend. Now, let us examine this problem situation to see the importance of this lesson for the day. In an exchange with your brother on scholarship in Europe, 
you express your love for African philosophy, but he instead seems disappointed in you. To him, African philosophers of yesterday and today are involved in the useless debate on the existence and the nature of African philosophy instead of applying philosophy to solve their existential problems. And the question that follows from this um, problem situation is, what arguments will you construct to prove that there is a trend of African philosophy which goes beyond the debate on the existence of African philosophy to propose solutions to the existential problems of Africa? And now, with this problem that is posed, we will now go to the first articulation of our lesson, which is definition and the basic tenets of the nationalistic ideological trend. And now, the first thing we have to remark here is that this trend is more concerned with the prescriptions. That is, prescription implies what? Implies the proposals of some African statesmen and intellectuals. They are strategically involved in the emancipation and independence of Africa from colonial imperialism. That is, they go beyond the debate on the existence of African philosophy to propose theoretical frameworks for African development. In brief, what we're saying here is that why inner philosophy, the professional trend, and philosophic sagacity are concerned with the question of the nature of African philosophy, the nationalistic ideological trend goes beyond this trend because the problem with them is not more whether African philosophy exists or not. African philosophy exists in its different orientations. The question now is, can we use some African theories for Africa to ensure African development? That is a basic concern of the nationalistic ideological trend. And this trend identifies and destroys all false beliefs about African people and cultures that have been developed by Western colonialist and racist thinkers. We all understand the views of some uh, Western racists about Africa. We have the views of people like uh, Levi Brun, Africans have a pre-logical mentality. We have the views of other philosophers like Hegel, that Africa is not a continent of history and reason. We also have the views of other of Western thinkers who feel that Africans cannot philosophize, they have no philosophy, no history, no, no philosophy, no history, no science. So this trend attempts to deconstruct and deny and, and remove all these negative tax that Westerners have put on Africans, and some of them include who? We have people like Kwame Nkrumah, we have Julius Nyerere, we have Mohamed Gaddafi, we have Samora Machel, we have Robert Mugabe, Nelson Mandela, Kenneth Kaunda, Sekou Toure, among others. And they defend African identity, the African culture, and the African consciousness. Now, what, is the, what are the objectives of this nationalistic ideological trend? The first objective is that this trend attempts to serve African interests in, its, in the global community, to deconstruct and reconstruct what, what was destroyed by the imperialists, to liberate the identity, the consciousness, and the culture of the marginalized African order. And it, it also goes beyond the trends, other trends, to make philosophy useful to the African community. And then, this trend also had a strictly political orientation because most of them are proposing political theories of African development. And they also valorize, that is, they try to show the importance of some African values and some African practices. And it is also a kind of what we call pragmatism, a pragmatic trend because it is based on the usefulness of African philosophy and theories of African philosophy. And here, questions are asked like, what is the best socialism for Africa? What are the foundations of the African personality? And how can we rescue African culture from Western capitalism? These are some of the questions that the nationalistic ideological trend attempts to give answers to. Now, we, we proceed now to the first um, ideology that we choose to examine today, which is communalism. Communalism here is considered as a universal ideology of African philosophy. In other words, in the South African language, it is called the Ubuntu philosophy. Because in all African theories of African emergence, there is always an aspect of communalism. Almost all ideologies of this trend have elements of communalism, 
And how can we look at communalism? It is just like the notion of Ubuntu. It is an ideology of African socialism. And due to the Western evil social practices or policies like capitalism, where the, the human beings consider others from the point of view of what they have and not who they are, we have individualism, we have racism, we have colonization. African philosophers prefer communalism as a moral solution. That is, how can African resist the capitalist, the individualist, the racist, and the colonial influence of the Western world? To African philosophers, the best answer to this question is to adopt communalism. Now, what is communalism then? It can be defined as an African moral view. Therefore, it falls under African moral philosophy ethics, in which unity, togetherness, brotherhood, and cooperation are the basics of socialization. Which means this is a, 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 an African theory which considers Africa as an extended family where everyone is a brother to each and everyone. And it is based on moral values like we have charity, we have love, we have collective ownership of resources such as land, cooperation in projects, and an extended family view. And what are we saying here? We're saying here is that, what we're saying here is that in Africa, for instance, it sharing is a common aspect in, Afri in the African community. Love is also seen both in good and, and hard moments. And then this is expressed by John Beatty in his famous expression, which says, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. And when he presents it like this, we see communalism as a form of paternalism. That is, Africans are living together as a family. Now, we go to the second trend, which is the second theory of the nationalistic ideological trend, which is the Ujama of Julius Nyerere. And Julius Nyerere is, uh, first of all, a Tanzanian. He's a Tanzanian philosopher, he was a statesman also. And Ujama is not an English word, it is in Swahili. And it, from that Swahili language, Ujama means family hood. It is a form of socialism, just like communalism. And here, Everyone is a brother to each and everyone. So we see that there's, there's a link between Ujama and communalism. It is also based on the extended family view and on the principle of self-reliance. What is self-reliance? This is a very important principle on Ujama. Here, John Nyerere is saying that Africans should not depend, it should not depend absolutely on the Western world as if they cannot also generate their own economic and, uh, economic and political power. Africans should rely on their own technology, it should build their own technology, and so as to emerge. And this Ujama is based on values like mutual cooperation, respect, equality, freedom, unity, and the common ownership of factors of production such as land. And it is from here that we see that this theory is a very important theory because you are asked, for instance, in the exam to evaluate the strength of Ujama. These are the strengths of Ujama. The first thing is that it advocates for mutual cooperation among, um, among Africans. Africans should cooperate with each other. Maybe, for instance, like we see what happens in the local communities where mothers move from one farm to the other, helping each other. Like today, they can decide to work on Madam X farm. Tomorrow, they work on Madam Y farm. And that's what mutual cooperation. There's also respect, which is mutual respect. There is equality, unlike maybe capitalism in the Western world where there is social inequality. There's freedom, there's unity, and there's also the common ownership of factors of production such as land. Now, we go to the third um, theory or ideology here, which is negritude. And negritude here is seen as a theory which advocates for the affirmation of the African identity. It was developed by French Africans in the diaspora, and that's why negritude comes come from the word negro, which means black or African. It is therefore a philosophy of, of identity which seeks to defend the African personality. And then we can now see that the motivation behind negritude was, during colonialism, the African race was considered as an inferior race. And that's why we also see colonialism went alongside racism. In order to affirm that the African identity, the African race, the African culture has dignity, these philosophers developed negritude as a solution. And therefore, it seeks to defend the pride that is in the black identity and in the black culture. It is a philosophy which aims at giving value 
to the African personality, and it is calling for all the Africans to go back to their roots. And by, by roots here, it means the culture, the tradition. Africans should valorize their culture. Instead of importing values from the West, the African culture needs to be valorized. Now, it, it was developed by philosophers like we have the Paul Seder Senghor, we have Aimé Césaire, we have Franz Fanon, we have Leon Damar. To Césaire, for instance, let me take an example. Negritude is simple recognition that one is black and, accept, and the acceptance that of our destiny as blacks, of our history and of our culture. Which means this is, in this way, Césaire feels that negritude is the opposite of assimilation. Instead of Africans to be assimilated by the Western culture, the Western history, the Western race, the Africans have to defend their history, their culture. To Le Paul Sedas negative is rooting oneself in oneself. That is going back to your own self, your own foundation. And self-affirmation and a confirmation of one's being. One being here implies what? One's culture. And that's why he, this particular um, African ideology was expressed in different works of art. Like we have, we have like films, we have drama, we have poetry, we and so on and so forth. Now, and the fourth um, theory or ideology we are going to examine now is conscientism by Kwame Krumah. And what is conscientism? Conscientism is an ideology which calls for an intellectual revolution as a necessary condition for the liberation of Africa. So the problem that Krumah wants to answer here is. What are the conditions necessary for African development? And for him, African development is only possible if Africans adopt conscientism. And how does he define conscientism? Before he even goes to that, he made a serious observation that practice without thought is blind, and thought without practice is empty. That is, practice without thought is blind, and thought without practice is empty. What is he saying here? The African development is a practice. And for such practice to be successful, there is need for a philosophical ideology, a philosophical theory, or a philosophical framework to guide that particular practice, else such practice will be empty. And here we can now realize that conscientism is also an illustration that African philosophy is important. It can help Africans to solve their problems. Consequently, for the liberation of Africa, which is a practice to be possible, it must be guided by a thought or philosophy, an ideology, a framework, and Krumah thinks that such framework is conscientism. Now, Krumah defined conscientism as an intellectual revolution, that is a change in the mindset, that is a revolution in our minds, that must direct the redemption of Africa. That is, he says, Conscientism is an intellectual revolution, that is a change in the mindset. And this change in the mindset, that is a revolution in our minds, is supposed to direct the redemption of Africa. And what, is, what does it mean by redemption of Africa? Development, emergence, and the revival of African values. Kwame Krumah was influenced by Karl Marx communism. We know that communism by Karl Marx is a social theory where he advocated for a classless society where everybody is equal. Krumah was influenced by this particular Western notion or ideology, and that's why he had to advocate for a classless and an equal society for Africa as a necessary condition for African development. Now, this conscientism also had a moral implication or a moral dimension or a moral principle. And the moral or the ethical principle of conscientism states that Africans should treat man not as a means to an end, but as an end in himself. Because we understand that Western capitalism, for instance, treats exploit man. But to Kruma, we should not use man as a means for economic exploitation or domination. But man, everything we are doing in Africa should be for the betterment of the living conditions of man as a whole. And then the basis of conscientism is materialism. We understand that that's the theory which holds that the basic reality is matter. Was influenced by Karl Marx, and we know that Karl Marx defended materialism. Krumah therefore developed conscientism to attain an equal, a classless, and 
an egalitarian society in Africa. He also called on Africans to exploit the Euro Christian, the Islamic values, and join them with the African values so as to attain holistic development. What is um, um, Krumah saying here? These are the Euro tenets. The first tenet is that he advocates that African society should be classless. Classless in the sense that we should not have people who belong to the first, first class, maybe because of material world position. They are considered as a bourgeoisie, the rich. That all factors of production should be put at the service of the whole community, where everybody will have access to it. And as such, Africans should be equal. And that, for, and that he is not saying that Africans should completely take away themselves from the Western world like we have in Ujama. He's saying that Africans should get a bit of what is good in the Christian religion. Christianity is not evil. But we can exploit some aspects from Christianity that, 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 that can be useful to us. We can exploit some aspects from Islam that can be useful to us. When we bring out these aspects from Islam and Christianity and join with our own African values, we will have a holistic development for Africa. And then we proceed again to the fifth ideology we have, which is Pan-Africanism. It is a socio-political ideology which, is, which seeks to unify both the natives in, African, in, the native in Africa and in the diaspora to affirm their existence, which means it is a collective worldview which advocates for the unity of Africa as a necessary condition for African development. And that is why, why conscientism calls for a mental revolution or an intellectual revolution, pan-Africanism calls for a social revolution. And it was defended by philosophers like Kwame Nkrumah, William Ewart, we have Dubois, Marcus Gave, we have Patmo, we have Tong, we have Nyerere, we have Sekou Toure, we have Gaddafi. And now we are going to proceed, um, dear students, to the second part of our reflection. We are going to engage now into the criticisms of the ideological trend. What are some of the limitations? Now, the first one we see here is that. Communalism leads to laziness. How? Because if we have a community where everything is put at the service of the community where there is no private ownership of the world, what happens? Some people will shy away from collective work because after all, even if they don't work, they will eat at the end of the day. Secondly, negative was too divergent. What do I mean? There was contradiction between the proponents. For instance, why Emile Seize said, Africans should be independent and that they should break away from the West. Senghor said Africans should be independent, but that they should continuously associate with the West. So this disunity uh, between them betrayed the intention behind this philosophy. Ujama was too conservative, for instance, when um, Nyerere says Africans should be self-reliant, the question is that, is Africa alone sufficient? We need the international community to interact with them for us to be able to emerge. We realized also that conscientism was self-contradictory because how can Krumah say for instance that you know the basic reality is matter and then he goes again to tell us that for us to develop we need a spiritual which is bringing out what is in Christianity and Islam. So there's a contradiction between materialism and spirituality, spiritualism in Krumah's conscientism. And then we realized that Pan-Africanism was too idealistic, that is it was too abstract to be real in the sense that um, this Pan-Africanism calls for the unity of Africa. Can, Af can we have a united state of Africa? Is it possible? We don't have the same economic resources in different African countries. And secondly, the African Africa is necessarily a tribal continent. How can we abolish tribes to have a united Africa from all perspectives? And then, dear students, we are going to look at the application exercises. And then we'll look at the, the questions I propose for, the, for our evaluation today. And then for question one, or for the instruction we have, underline the most appropriate answer. Underline the most appropriate answer. And then question one, which of the following pairs of ideologies are too conservatory? Which of the following pairs of ideologies are too conservatory? We have Pan-Africanism, Pan and conscientism, A, B, we have negritude and conscientism, 
C, we have negritude and the Ujama, and D, we have the Ujama and conscientism. And the answer I propose is C, negritude and Ujama. And how are they conservatory? When negritude says the Africans should go back to their roots, to their foundation, and that the black race is the best race, it's, it, it makes it look as if the white race is not also considered. And that's why we see people like Jean Paul Sartre who said uh, negritude is an anti-racist racist. That is, you are criticizing racism by practicing racism. Ujama is also conservative because Julian Nyerere said Africans should be self-reliant, that is, they should depend only on what is African. The question is that if we depend only on our economic resources as Africans, we stop associating with the rest of the world. Are we going to be able to have development that is consistent and holistic? It is not going to be possible. Now, we go to the second question. Which of the following is false? It's a false limitation of the nationalistic ideological trend. Which of the following is a false limitation of a, the nationalistic ideological trend? A, it is essentially experimental. B, it is too idealistic. C, it is divergent in conception. D, it is self-contradictory in principle. And the answer I propose here is that it is essentially experimental. These are the various limitations. For instance, we have um, Pan-Africanism was too, too idealistic. I've explained why. Negative was too divergent. And then conscientism was self-contradictory, but none of these ideologies were meant to be experimented in a laboratory. Besides, ideologies of social of socialization are not the same like theories in science. In science, for instance, we can experiment, but ideologies are meant to change it, um, the way people behave for them to behave in a particular way. Now, we now go to the assignment I propose for you to do at home for the next um, uh, class, and this is the question, take down your pains, and then you can work on it for our next class. And the question is, construct one argument to prove that the nationalistic ideological train is an illustration of the role of African philosophy to African development. I take over the question, construct one argument to prove that the nationalistic ideological train is an illustration of the role of African philosophy to African development. That is, how can the nationalistic ideological trend of African philosophy help Africa to develop? Is it possible? You are supposed to build an argument for that for our next class. And then, for further readings, dear students, you can also read uh, books like We Have a Companion to African Philosophy by Kwesi Wudedu. We have A Return to My Native Land by Emile Césaire. We have Second Long Noir Apport, that is in uh, that is by Leopold Sedar Senghor. You can also read, read uh, Conscientism uh, by Kwame Roman. And then for the next lesson, um, dear students, you are going to work on the natural origin of the state because we are going to reflect now on the first lesson on the uh, advanced philosophy. And the question here is that the civil state that we have today, where did it come from? I mean, the state, like we have the state of Cameroon, the state of Nigeria, the United States of America. How did all these states come into existence? Is there a point in time in the history of man where man lives without a state? If, if there is no point, then how did man live before the state come into existence? That is the, natu the natural theory of the origin of the state. And to orientate your, your reflection here, I will, I will also invite you to read um, Aristotle because he's one of those philosophers who defend this natural origin of the state. We have Plato. So look at the views of Plato and Aristotle on the natural origin of the state. <laughs> Ona tege majang matege ndom mane tambia ninya ne njubya yen ngani bana matege mot ngani la kiri watege ndong esetina bia dinkido mane tambia ninya ne njubya yen tamtama mote tamzabike 
Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne injo biyen 